Hi everyone. Um, okay, and um, today we are going to have a discussion about publishing in the AAS journals from the editor's point of view. And our um, two speakers today are uh, Leon Golap and uh, Augusto Muhench. And <laughs> um, Leon got his um, bachelor's degree in physics from the City College of New York. Um, in 1967, and he got his PhD from MIT in 1972. Uh, he was doing experimental high energy particle physics. Then after that, he was at the American Science and Engineering doing X-ray um, astronomy and solar studies until 1976 when he joined the CFA. And currently, he's a, a senior astrophysicist at the CFA. And our second speaker, um, August Moon, Moon he was, uh, he's also a senior astrophysicist um, with the Solar and Stellar X-ray Group. And he got his bachelor's degree um, in uh, physics from George Peck. Uh, and he got PhD um, from University of Florida in 2002. And he did postdocs at the Spitzer Science Center and SAO and before he became a, an astrophysicist at the Smithsonian Astrophysical Observatory in 2009. Okay. Um. I'm not sure how to turn the lights down. It's not working. Looks okay. <laughs> ah, I have that thing shining in my face. That's what's wrong. <laughs> okay, so I'm supposed to uh, talk about the publication process, the editorial process, and then Gus will talk about how data uh, are handled these days and things have changed quite a bit uh, over the last few years. So, um, just to make sure that you all know, when you submit uh, these days to the AAAS publications, there are four places where things can end up. And you actually now have a new option, which I'll talk about in a bit. But what we are used to calling AppJ, as you know, is three journals. There's letters, the main journal, and supplements, uh, and AJ, Astronomical Journal, is also part of the process. It's one of the options. Um, I do the solar and heliospheric uh, papers. Those almost always go to AppJ or the supplements, but other topics can be assigned to other journals. And uh, usually the scientific editor decides, but uh, you can state a preference, and most often it's listened to. Not always, but usually. We try to please. So, this is uh, the people who handle the editorial operations. Uh, you may get messages from these people. Normally, you won't interact with them until after the paper is accepted. But uh, you might have trouble submitting things, and Janice Sexton is the one who uh, we always call on to help. Um, I'll talk about what Susan Kohler does uh, later. Uh, there is this publication that you might be interested in knowing about. Uh, these are the faces that go with those names. Uh, the guy in the top middle is sitting right there, and you'll hear from him in a, in a few minutes. So all of these journals, just for your information, are owned by the American Astronomical Society. 
Um, it wasn't always that way. The main change took place in the 1970s. If you go back and look at hard copies, you'll see that it says American Astronomical Society on them. Um, what has changed in recent years uh, is mostly invisible to you, although it affects you. It, it's mainly seen by the editors. There's a whole bureaucracy now, and decisions are made sometimes without consulting with us. Um, so the editors have less control over the policy. Uh, there's a publications board. Uh, the executive office of the AAS down in Washington, D.C. ultimately controls everything. So the whole thing has grown substantially. Um, the number one reason, I guess, is the number of papers that are handled. I'll talk about that in a minute, but also the diversity of different places that you now have for publishing things. So there's a lot of experimentation going on um, in what is being offered, what are your options, and I'll talk about that in a bit. Uh, so there is a peer review system that is handled by EJ Press. Uh, production and copy editing are handled by IOP Publishing. Content hosting is over in Bristol, again, by IOP. So it's an international uh, enterprise right now. Uh, this is just a bit of explanation of what IOP is, uh, we can talk more about that if you like, but it's uh, just so you know that it's there. So before I talk about the submission process, I'd, I'd like to mention that um, the AAS has this publication uh, that comes out, uh, let's see, every week, NOVA? Okay, <laughs> so uh, Susanna Kohler uh, edits this. Uh, when we get papers that we are handling as editors, we have the option to suggest that this paper deserves to be highlighted. We send it to that suggestion to Susanna, and she picks, oh, maybe eight or ten papers per week uh, to, to be highlighted in NOVA, like this. Uh, those papers get many more downloads than the average, either because they're good or because they've been highlighted. I'm not sure which it is. Well, uh, I'm saying I'm not sure what the cause and effect is here. <laughs> but anyway, um, it's up to her to decide which ones she picks. Uh, again, this is for your information, just so you know that this can happen. Um, this is what Gus Munch will be talking, Munch will be talking to you about, I think. Um, so I'll, he'll update you on the various progress that's been made and the changes that are going on in the content handling. Uh, so this is the main thing that I want to talk about, is uh, the way that the editorial process works now from the time you submit things. Uh, it used to be that the editor-in-chief would, all the papers would go to him, and he would parcel them out to the scientific editors. Um, 
that got to be too big for one person to do. There's just too many papers. So there's an extra level uh, that's been inserted between the editor-in-chief and the scientific editors, uh, and that is the corridors. Uh, and the people who handle those corridors are called lead editors. I'm one of them for the solar and heliospheric. Uh, so when you submit a paper, it doesn't go to Ethan anymore. You pick which corridor you want it to go to. And there are descriptions on the website, and I'll show them to you in a second. Uh, we also have a sort of free-roaming statistics editor. Uh, Eric Feigelson has been berating us for years that we're using 200-year-old methods uh, in dealing with statistics, and he's been trying to modernize how, how they're handled. So any papers that deal heavily and rely on the statistical methods, in addition to the scientific editor that handles them, we will also get an opinion, a comment, an evaluation from Eric, and that will become part of the review. Uh, the corridors are these. Um, there is now an instrumentation and software and laboratory astrophysics and data, so you can actually write a paper about some valuable software that you want to make available to the community. So it doesn't have to be a new scientific result uh, per se, although you're encouraged to give an example of how the software works, but you can now submit software papers. Uh, other than that, these are, I think, familiar uh, categories and that's who they get submitted to. We also have, uh, you saw that little new thing uh, on my first slide, uh, we now have revived research notes. Uh, AppJ used to have them and did away with them, I think in the 70s. Uh, these are non-refereed notes, uh, no more than a thousand words, and one figure or one table. Uh, they are uh, indexed, so they are citable, uh, just not as a refereed publication. Uh, this has started just four or five months ago, I think. Uh, Chris Lintot is the one who handles them. Uh, and it seems to be already very popular. Uh, I don't know what else to say about the research notes. We'll, we'll see how it gets used. Yes? So it's the idea that maybe, for example, you do something as a poster and you put it as a note and then later you develop it as a full blown paper. Like that is that is one possibility. Um, I think that Chris is not quite sure what the range and scope of this will be. Uh, he, uh, he's feeling his way with it right now. He, there really isn't a referee. He scans for obvious nonsense. He works a bit with the person who submitted it, just in case the language needs improving or the writing is not understandable. Um, he will occasionally ask a specialist, like solar papers, He'll ask me, you know, is this crazy or is this worth proceeding with? 
And I typically say, well, it's an interesting interpretation of this data. It's probably wrong, but it would be interesting if it's true. And, and, and he'll tell me that's 90% of what we get. <laughs> but it's a way of announcing availability of data sets, for instance. Um, some result that you think people will find interesting, but that isn't yet a paper, as, as you're saying. It's an experiment. We'll, we'll see how it goes. I'm, I'm happy to talk about the data releases, because we find that to be really interesting to me as a, as a data release mechanism. So if you have questions about that, I can try to answer them and we discuss yes. OK, uh, the letters had been off by itself it, as a separate operation. It has now been combined into the same editorial stream uh, as the main journals. So it might not look different to you. I'm, I'm not sure you would notice the difference. But for us, it, it's. Uh, it makes it easier to pass things back and forth, like a letter might get sent over to the main journal, um, if that seems more appropriate. There is a relaxed page limit now on letters, because it's mainly an online publication. So you don't have to really adhere so tightly to the old guidelines. Uh, that makes it harder, actually, to decide where a paper should go. Fred Rosio, the editor, annoyed most of us by saying, well, the important ones should go to AppJ Letters. <laughs> oh, we, we differed with him on, on that. The main new thing for us, and it turns out the Letters has been doing this for a few years, we now have to rate reviewers. So when a review comes in, before we can send it to the author, we have to give the reviewer a rating. OK? We have no choice. We can't proceed until we do that. And Letters has been doing this, apparently, for a few years. 90% uh, of the reviewers get a rating of good. <laughs> if you're exceptionally good, we can say that. If you're exceptionally bad, we can say that. But very few people fall into either of those. There are a few people, actually, that will never be asked to review again. And now we have a way of saying it. But you have to be really egregious for that to happen. Is there a rubric for this rating? Is, is what? Is there a rubric, or is this purely subjective? Rubric. Criteria. 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 We got criteria from <laughs> the editor in chief. Is it public information? I can go look up that email if you want. <laughs> All it says is give most people a good rating. If somebody, you know, really impresses you by being thorough and quick, you know, make it very good. You know, if somebody has to be hounded for months and sends in a poor report, you know, give it a whatever that lower rating is. So it's not quality of the, of the review, of the refereeing, it's timeliness of the review. It's both. It's both. It's both. And it's mainly the criterion is, are, do you get a review that is actually useful? you would be surprised that there are some people who send back things that you just can't use. Yeah. And they may think they're doing their job, but they're not. It's a small number of people. And you might ask me, can I find out what my rating is? I don't know. They can't find out, can they? <laughs> Yes. 
Okay, uh, new features, I, I'll skip this because you're gonna hear that in a minute. And that is it, that's all I've got to say. You'll hear me. Does this work okay? Okay, let's see if I can get this to work. Good. Um, okay, so again, uh, my name is Gus Minch. Um, I have been with the AAAS now for about three years as one of the data editors. And so there are two data editors. Um, as Leon described, um, Greg Schwartz, who's been doing it for 17 years, and I've been doing it for three. Um, so we have different amounts of experience with the community and different kinds of views, I think, on, on uh, exactly the best ways to interact with you to improve your papers. Um, the goal of my presentation is to give you a flavor for the kinds of things that we support in your articles and the kinds of work that we do um, on your articles. So these are the five titles. And so I first wanted this, I borrowed this from Greg then, and then um, turned it into a three-page slide uh, to go through sort of a timeline of the journals to give you a sense of when particular uh, features to support data in articles came about and how um, it's, it's, fl it's flowing over time. And so there's some things that I left out. So I um, got my PhD in 2002 and the 90s were a blur of learning ADS and um, trying to figure out how uh, publishing papers worked and, and the online things were all new for me. So, um, so I've missed quite a few layers here. Um, in, in the early 90s, in the mid 90s, there's a lot of work done on CD-ROMs. There was a whole VHS series that I'm not listing here. So the journals have been thinking about how better to improve data visualization and, and data in articles for a while. This is gonna be heavily weighted towards the things that I work on in, in the recent history. Um, so this gives you a sense of, of when AS Tech was first started. So I'm not going to go into the nitty gritty of every new feature in AS Tech, except to say that, that, that the journals adopted a tech-based format very soon after it was um, uh, um, uh, developed. Um, and the uh, upgrade cycle has accelerated greatly in the past few years. Um, I'll, I'll go into a little, bit a little bit of detail on that. Um, one benchmark that I'd like to point out on this slide is that in the late 90s is when the journals moved to um, HTML. Right, so I moved to a markup, a structured markup language for the articles, still continue to use PDFs, but the underlying uh, platform was, became HTML-based in the late 90s. And the first data editor was hired in 2000. At, uh, he worked out of Arizona. And one of his primary tasks was to improve the quality and um, uh, metadata that are in the tables that you produce. Okay? Um, in 2005, figure sets were added. So we had this web-based platform um, where you could publish thousands of figures, but we didn't want to print thousands of figures, so we created a, a, a mechanism for online um, figures. You probably know all of this. That was also the year that AS Tech 5.2 was released. Um, in the late 2000s, so 10 years after we went to HTML, we moved from Chicago to IOP, and then began releasing a few more figures. So in 2010, there was a project that was started for data behind the figures. This was encouraging authors who uh, have, a, have a, um, a figure of a spectrum or a light curve to actually release the underlying data for that curve. And so it involved emailing you and having you respond with a table and then editing that table and including it with the articles. So at this point, we have you know, machine readable tables as online material. We have um, figure sets or um, these online compendium of, of figures. And we have data behind the figures. And then in 2014, uh, the journals, the executive office and the um, um, the leaders of the, of the society decided that we needed to have a futures task force, which looked at the landscape for publishing and said, what can we change both structurally and as a platform for your publishing to make it better? And so most of what I'm going to talk about today is the things that have come out of that futures task force um, uh, work. Um, so I was hired in 2014, um, and that was also the first year that online interactive figures became at, was added to this set of things. So an online interactive figure is a web-based HTML figure that um, has uh, interactivity, um, uh, um, pan and zoom, and other kinds of ways of um, investigating or, or looking at that figure. And I'll, I'll show many examples. In 2015, print ended. So um, even though we'd been on a platform for almost 20 years of HTML, but also printing, and in 2015, we ended print. So now the main products are the HTML 
um, article, which is the version of record. So just to be clear, if you want to go around wondering what the version of record is for a AAS journal article, it is the web-based version. Um, and then the PDF is a, is a subset of what's, what's seen in the HTML. Um, so most of my work has been involved in, in, in supporting things like um, animations as proper figures, uh, has been uh, in encouraging or supporting authors that want to create interactive figures. Um, but I, again, I'm not going to go into the details of AS Tech, but in, in 2016 was the first update in 11 years for, for AS Tech. Um, so I, I, I think this is exactly right. It was 11 years of feature requests by authors. Um, and also uh, an adoption, adoption of the Emulate AppJ as a, as a, as a platform for the, for the tech, public, pla tech package. Um, something else you may or may not know about is that in, in that same year, we began releasing articles as EPUBs. So I'm not expecting you to know what an EPUB is. EPUB is an HTML-based container for your article. Um, it, is, it, it is significantly more accessible um, as, a, as an object than a PDF. Um, article is, and I'm happy to have a conversation about that uh, more later. That was also the year that we began encouraging um, both software papers and offer, also trying to improve software citation in the articles. Um, and so th in, the, in the past year, um, we released another version of AS Tech. Um, we uh, integrated with collaborative platforms like um, Overleaf and Authoria. We released research notes. And then we began a journal accessibility project. So the Society's um, Wicked group um, gave, released recommendations on accessibility, and we've begun to respond to those and figure out how to improve both the platform and the guidelines for you as authors. And then th in this year, we've only managed to um, release AS6 6.2, which is mostly um, some minor features mm -hmm. and bug fixes. So what does this sort of timeline mean in terms of someone asked me um, during the pizza time quantitatively? How, how are people responding to these things? So this is a, this is a plot of, of digital elements over time. And... Um, all the material to create this plot was taken from a website called Astro Explorer. And so what Astro Explorer is, is, is a website where every image, every figure that's in your papers is released at publication open access. So in essence, your article is released and then all the figures are released on this website. And I'll, I'll show it and, and use it as a way of finding animations or figure sets or other kinds of things you may want to emulate in other authors. This would be the tool that you would use. So this is a plot. So there's three, there's four lines. Um, the plot, the, the line is increasing is animations, right? So last year we published almost 500 animations in, in 4,000 articles. Um, the bottom line is figure sets, so they're slowly increasing, um, uh, not quite as rapidly as uh, animations, but there's still a, a high level of adoption by authors of online figures. And then the two middle lines are, are things that I came up with. We've been averaging across all of our titles 4,000 articles a year. Um, and then, fun, strangely enough, if you actually look at the number of figures per article, it's exactly like 9.5, and it's been that way for like a decade. I don't, I don't know what that means, if it's true across other fields, but it's, it's, uh, I find that interesting. Um, so this is a plot of, of the adoption of certain kinds of digital elements um, uh, over the past uh, 10 years. I want to talk about what that adoption means for your article. So one of the changes that we made is that, that, that I've been working on has been that, that these online materials are not supplemental materials, right? So an animation of the BNKL data cube, right? Or an animation of solar physics data is not a supplemental material. It is the data product that's, that's, that's being used in the analysis. And so we moved them out of supplemental materials and made them an actual figure. So there are now animated figures in your articles, right? So there's no need to create necessarily a very complicated static figure that represents the, 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 the multidimensional one. You can use the animation um, as that figure. And this means a few things, right? You should refer to them as figures, not as supplemental material. Um, there's a streaming uh, widget that's in the article, so the, the bits are being streamed. You can actually click on it. I can show examples, but probably better after um, this. And so, and there's also a download button, so you can get back the author's original animation rather than the streamed version. So this is a, a way that animations have become central to the article. This is another example. So what I was trying to show is a cutout from the HTML. That's the player. There are buttons at the bottom to download the videos and, and access different versions of them. This is a figure set. So this is a one particular like curve. And then in this case, there's 61 like curves for this article. The, I think our biggest, the most online figures that anyone's published is in the thousands of, art, of, of figures. So this is SED atlases, like curve atlases. And, you can, and there's buttons 
it's at the bottom of the button, just download the whole thing. Um, or you can actually scroll through like an like a image um, thumbnail. Um, so we've published about 800 of these. And again, they were supplemental material, now they're the actual figure in, in the article. And so this, is, this means that you're not using data as a supplement, you're using data in it. In the, yes? Okay, so we, would, we, we are working on a project for search. Um, we would, the answer is no, but it's, it's not something we haven't thought about. And we are going back and forth with IRP to add like a little search bar, because when you have that many, yeah, it's, not, it's not an efficient way of finding them. You have no idea how they're necessarily sort. There's a lot of, yeah, I, I could talk to you more about that. Um, so uh, this is another increase. Oh, yes. They only, so in terms of printing the paper, this is the PDF is a subset of the version of record. So the only thing that's seen in an animation or an interactive figure or a figure set is the one static representation. So you have a static, I'll, I'll talk about that in what you all need to know as authors, is you have some printable rec rec version and then there's a, some augmented text that tells the person that this is a ritual thing online. So this is a plot of a, another digital element. This is interactive figures. And I'm going to quickly go through the kinds of how this has changed over the past three or four years. And so when I started, there was one. Um, last year, we published, I think, 15 or 20. This year, we already have 38. Um, and, and that number is coming from our authors who said, well, if I'm going to do this, I'm just going to publish all my figures in an interactive format. And I'll, I'll give some examples. Um, so what does an interactive uh, figure mean right now for you as an author. It's something that you build using a toolkit that you have access to. We give recommendations, we try to direct um, authors towards toolkits like Maya VI or um, Sketchfab or other kinds of websites that would help you to do it, but right now we don't provide you sort of drop-in tools to create these things. Fortunately that hasn't caused people to not do it, but um, we're looking at ways to fund um, infrastructure to help you do it more easily. Again, I'll talk about that in questions. Um, so authors create these figures. Um, the figures have expectations. They have expectations that they have buttons that allow the user to reset them and to um, interact with them. Um, when, you, when you go, this is, goes back to the question of what's printable, when you come to the, the website, it's not like you're panning, you know, reading the, the web, and all of a sudden something's not moving. Right? There's a button that you have to click in order to inter start the interaction. Okay, so try to both allow that um, visualization to be there without interrupting the overall flow of the article. Um, and again, there's this, I cut off the edges for this one. Um, there are requirements that this, so this, this viewport, this JavaScript HTML viewport, could be seen as being reasonably fragile, right? So a browser may change, a technology may change, right? And so we have requirements that the underlying data be included. It's sort of like, instead of saying data behind the figures is a, is a nice thing that you should have to make your figure more reproducible, for these type of figures, it's a requirement, right? So you have to provide a data set that is being visualized so that the person, if they have any issues with the interaction, can actually get back to the original data. So right now, there are four flavors of interactive figures. Um, in 2014, there was one, and that was the, the top row. So the four are um, uh, 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 volume-rendered surfaces um, uh, using a, a technology called X3D. Um, the first paper was done by an author who said, I want to do this in your, art, in your journal articles. And so we said, okay, we'll figure out how to do it. Um, and now you have, these are three examples. Again, I can click on them where you have uh, data cubes. Um, we just had an author, one of the authors who, who turned all their figures into, um, into X3D figures. He, he created a little script um, with Maya VI and Python to sort of convert all his radio data cubes into X3D versions. Um, and then multiple layers. This is a, a instrumentation realization in X3D. And so that's been something that we've supported for the whole time. Um, the next row are, uh, are, are again, a primarily Python-based uh, toolkit called Bokeh. Um, so Bokeh JavaScript. Um, the first one um, is from a paper by Ashley Villar for here at the CFA. And then the other two um, were also done by um, a scientist who was at the CFA. Um, where, and if I, I, I'm happy to show you the examples um, in a minute where you can interact with the data points, interact with the, the, the images. Um, and that was the second flavor that we supported. The third is actually feeling like we're doing something simpler, which is simply enabling authors to do blinks. Right? So in the middle here is, um, is a, is a, uh, in the middle um, is, a, is a blink where um, chat hole uh, 
uh, created different images of the date of the figure, and you're able to blink through them. And then these other examples are, are where the author made it so you can blink on and off certain pieces of the figure. Um, and this is simply, in terms of technology, it's simply being able to create a PNG that has transparency so that you can then blink through them. And then the last one, which we're excited about, but also a little bit more tentative, is, is something called Sketchfab. So what we're doing here is we're allowing a third-party website to push pixels into the article. Right? So in this case, in the other cases, these are things that are supported by IOP. You know, we, own, we, have the, we have the pixels, we have the bits. And then in this case, um, authors, and, and I can explain in one sentence why Sketchfab does it better than anybody else does it in terms of rendering large volume data efficiently on the web. And so in this case, the authors uploaded their data to Sketchfab, and then we pushed the pixels through to the article. But again, there are requirements under each of these so that there's data bits that can, then if something happens with Sketchfab, that figure goes down, what you'd see is a static representation, and you'd have access to the data bits link that we, we do keep as a journal. So these are the things you need to know. Um, authors mark up an interactive figure, whether it be animated or, or otherwise with a static representation. You treat it just like a float. You refer to it just like a float in your LaTeX. Um, you can say that it's online or animated, that's fine, but you know, it's, 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 in terms of your article structure, it's the same. Um, this is really important, this block of text here. That is that that caption, for that, I mean, that caption for that animation needs to capture what it is about that interactive element that, the, that, a, re, that a, a, reader may not have a reader who may not have access to it would understand. So, okay. What that means is that if you have a, this is a very common case, you have an animation that describes a particular solar physics data set. Um, if that does not, if, if you write a caption that says there's, there's arrows here and there's lines here and it does X, Y, and Z, and the animation does something completely different, a person who doesn't have access to the data cube doesn't know what they're missing, doesn't know what they're seeing, doesn't know what they're not able to see if they have a disability or they have access issues to the article. And so that caption needs to include descriptive text. And so I'm going to talk about this a little bit later when I talk about accessibility in the journals, is that there's a, there's a need in order to make your articles more accessible to change how we write captions and how we um, describe the material that's in figures. I'll get back to that. Um, Greg and I are, are ready to consult on any of these things. We get sort of regular requests, please look at my figures, see if it works. It almost always does. Or we know how to validate them to make it work um, efficiently. And I don't have a link here for you to actually write down an email and send it to me right now saying you want to do this, but you can talk to me afterwards. And then we have a graphics guide that is in the works. Um, well, it currently supports everything you've seen so far. And what I'm doing right now is trying to improve it for accessibility. So that's, that's like the cool stuff, right? That's, the, that's the how to improve your, your figures and your um, presentation of your data and your articles. I, I want to make sure you know the other things that Greg and I do. Um, and so you may be getting reviews that have a block of text that say something like, the data editor says you should do this, or the data editor says that you should improve your software citation like that. And so those are coming from real people. Greg, you know, they don't have, we don't have names in, in the system like that, but um, uh, you don't get an email specifically from us a lot of the time. But what we're doing, and I'll, I'll go through how we do this in, in a second, um, is we review these articles uh, for data, for software, that material is passed to the scientific editor. The scientific editor makes a decision. Yes, this is really important. I agree. Passes it to the author as part of the, the peer review process to improve the paper. Okay? Um, and we also have a data guide, which is, again, also something that I'm, I spend a lot of time working on. And we also love to talk about this um, at any point in the review process. Okay, so there's two kinds of data review that we do. The first one is data review at submission. And this is something we started last year, and so the 60% was 60% of last year, and now we are getting closer to 100% of all submitted articles, depending on if someone goes out of town and we don't catch the article in the view, view process. And what this means is we, we do a bunch of things. We run scripts on your paper to pull out certain kinds of links that may have data. So if you say something like, um, I have all my code on GitHub, or I put all my data on GitHub, or something like that, we have a script that pulls that out, and then Greg or I look at it and see, oh yeah, you, you've put a significant amount of supplemental material on a website that we don't consider to be archival. And so we will instantiate then a review process that says you should do X, Y, and Z to make that material more, um, better preserved. Um, 
we look at other links, so plain Jane, plain links, excuse me, plain links to material on, um, plain links to material on, uh, on um, EDU websites, anything that looks like um, uh, your story material that, could, that needs to be archived um, will then um, flag you for, for some kind of review of that material. Um, Greg also, he's been doing this longer than I have. Greg looks at uh, spectra and time series and make recommendations. Like these spectra would be really useful to, um, uh, uh, to the reader and we'll re recommend that you then um, send that material in. And then there's also reviews for code and code citations. So you'll, we have parsers that will go through and, um, uh, and look for mentions of code. And Greg will say, oh, you've mentioned this code, but you haven't cited it, or, or you need to be citing this material. That works really well if you talk about the software that you use in your paper. It doesn't work so well if you never talk about software at all. Um, the second review that happens is a post acceptance. So of those 4,000 articles, Greg or I look carefully at about 15 to 20%. I think last year was 17% of those articles. And so we do things like standardize the tables to ensure that they can be ingested into CDS and Vizier. Um, we look at the figures. I I've tried an experiment looking at figures to make sure that they're using uh, good uh, color palettes. Um, that's, I'm not sure how to do that efficiently yet. Um, we run scripts again to, to look at the code mentions and see if they're cited properly. And, and, and during that phase, you will get an email from Greg or I that says, we need X from you. We need you to do, we recommend you do this. For animated figures, you know, your caption really doesn't describe the, the, um, the, the, the animation very well, so I will rewrite it and say this is what I think is a lot more accessible caption. Um, we look for uh, archived DOIs to data, and then we wrap all this stuff up and send it along with your paper to, to IOP so that in the final production process it gets blended into the final article. Um, I want to make sure that you know that we have other ways of making you cite. I mean, we uh, uh, can recognize, this is an easy case, right? This is a scatterplot matrix um, in the upper left. And in this case, the author did not include a citation to the code that was used to make that article, make that figure, but I knew what code that was. And so I was able to go back to them and say, please cite the relevant material. Um, we also have a block of, of, of LaTeX here, um, a command called slash software. And, and the terminology I use is context-free citation. So you may have written a paper and you may not have thought about, for whatever reason, the code that you used. It's, we're not going to require you to go back and rewrite or add a section on code. You're able to do context-free inclusion. So I use NumPy, I used PySpecKit. You probably would include that one in, in your inline. Um, but it allows you to include these software mentions and citations at the end of your article, so after the facilities block, okay? I lastly want to talk, and it isn't lastly, I was hoping to thread it through everything I've said so far, um, is that we're working on a project for accessibility in the journal. So in the end of 2016, um, the, the working group on um, accessibility and disability released recommendations to the journals. And by these journals, they meant all journals, right? Not just the AAS journals. But we've, along with IRP Publishing, are trying to respond to that, those recommendations in a couple of ways. Um, we have developed, um, I have developed an editor training that the editors have gone through. Um, to try to make them aware of where there are issues in the publishing pipeline to produce, and you know, the, the final outcome is not very accessible right now. And I can talk about that, but um, we're trying to create guidelines for you as authors to improve the structure and content of your figures and your text to make it in more accessible um, material. And so these are things that are in process. Um, and then again, if you have questions about it, we stand ready to sort of interact with you um, and uh, improve them. I, I want to I do this experiment before I run out of time, and, and that is to talk about descriptive captions, or at least to, to have you start thinking about what I mean when I say descriptive captions. So it might have been easy in the case with animations that, oh, okay, I have an animation, it does X, I have a figure, it does Y, and I need to ensure that, they, that the captions describe the individual elements clearly. That might have made sense. In this case, this is, a, this is that same scatterplot matrices from before, and this is the original caption. Right, so imagine that you cannot access this figure, either because of a disability, uh, low vision, you're blind, um, you only have the text itself, and is that sufficient to describe this? And so I, I am not a person who, who works on um, uh, the cosmological study that this, I'm a star formation person, so I, I sort of was like, well, okay, well, 
This might be a little bit more accessible because at least it has the, the link to what it is that I'm looking at, but coded as corner.py. Um, with this version, I've tried to expand it. I've said scatterplot matrices, if you know what that is. Um, it, it shows the covariance. And then you could imagine a, a, a descriptive caption where you go even beyond that, and you, you, you capture in that caption the scientific result that is implicit. So you go from a very concise, which when I was writing papers in the 19, to, when I first was writing papers in 1995, 97, right, conciseness was what we were taught, right? The caption should not repeat things that are already in the figure. That's not accessible. It just isn't. And I, <laughs> I say it firmly because I've had lots of conversations with, with editors and other people in, this, in the process who say, well, we can't ask people to write two blocks of text. Well, I'm not asking, you know, but there is a gradient here in accessibility that, um, that we should think about. And so I wanted to leave this for, with you as a test to start thinking about what it means to write more descriptive captions. So my, I've gone way past my time. Um, my, my retrospective on this, are a few things that stopped me. One is to go back is that I have articles that have no mention of code at all, right? So it's just as if it came right out of a pencil and paper or a typewriter, right? The, 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 it, it, it did not occur to the person writing that paper to talk about the, fundament, the underlying code or software that was used to create that result, okay? I also think it's interesting, this is my stepping outside of my, I'm looking at Leon, my role as a, as a data editor is that there's questions of authorship that are really interesting that I, that, I, that I see in code or I see in data. Like who's the first author on a piece of data? Who's the first author on a piece of code? Is it the same as the first author on the paper? Is it this, when, you, when you write, you know, it's the same problem they have when you, when you write a paper with many collaborators, what are we doing when we say you're an author or you're not an author? Um, I have lots of questions about author education. I could take your submission form and make it like really unpleasant. Not because I don't want it to be easy for you to submit a paper, because I want you to think about every stage of accessibility and data and software. So what is the, what is the right medium? What is the right balance of educating you about the articles that you're producing and getting you have a, have a positive response and, and do those things? And the last one, which I, I did just add, is I... I and myself working on what it means to uh, uh, direct authors towards making more accessible publications. And so what does that influence look like? What is effective, right? W would this room, let me, let me describe the problem differently. Would this room be fuller, more full, um, if this were not a talk about publishing? Which is like, I've, in my three years, I, I always had this interesting, I want more people here. I want every seat filled. I want you to be excited about publishing. And you're not, you, you write your papers, you put them on an archive, you send them for peer review, you do your jobs. But some of these things, especially accessibility, really require you to rethink a lot of that. And so how do we create excitement and education in, in that process? So I'm gonna, um, I was originally told we should have time for lots of questions. And so we're, we're closing in on the end. So um, I, I'm done there. Now the referee gets traditional thing, and the HTML stuff occurs after the paper is then set. So what do you do if you, if you get a, an article of a referee that really depends on you seeing all this fancy right. stuff? You have an answer to that. I, I, have, I have a couple of answers. So um, one answer. So the question was. Um, if you're creating HTML articles, why don't we do HTML review or HTML proofing, right? So you as an author, this is one of my most baffling problems, which is that you as an author never see the HTML version of your article unless you go there after the fact. And so I'll go backwards. And that is that we're, we're asking nicely and asking with more force that IOP create some kind of HTML-based proofing of that process so that you can see how your figures look. You can see what the accessibility issues might be for someone accessing that, that object. And that, that's a big, that's, a, that's like a sea change. I mean, yeah, a, that's, it's a really about, huge change. Latex, yeah. Well, you are, so you, you sort of are when you're using some of these collaborative platforms. So that's my sort of, that's the, that's the trick, which is that as people start to use collaborative platforms like Overleaf or Authoria, you're, in at, you're at some level starting to author in a less latex -y way, and you're, you're on the way towards something that's more HTML native. So your real question though was, what about peer reviewers? And so what we do is, because we flag everything when they come through, we create websites for the, the we create our websites that 
the peer reviewer can then access the web, those versions. Because what we don't want is for you to set up a website. If, if we really, if we believe in anonymous peer review, we don't want you setting up a website for your objects. So. How does that work? Um, the question was, how does the statistics review work? Basically, the statistics editor puts a comment into the file. So when I go to that file, I see the green box with his comment there. It's up to the editor to decide what to do with that comment and you can send it to the referee or if the report has come in already you can send it to the author right e either way the idea is to make it known to the author but he is not a referee of the paper it's up to the scientific editor to decide so should the scientific editor, does the editor tell the authors? Whether? The author, yes. The editor can tell the author, here's what our statistics editor says, you need to take this into account. And can you then have a discussion with the statistics editor? Can I then what? Could the authors then have a discussion with the statistics editor? How does that go on? Because you're, you're, you're talking to the referee, right, as an author. And you yes. sometimes back and forth, and you respond to the comments and vice versa. With this statistics comment, there isn't, didn't appear, I had one of yes. those. Yes. Um, it did, didn't appear to be a way to interact. No, it has people. to be mediated by the scientific editor. If the author replies to the statistics comment, you can bring Eric back in and say, what do you think of this reply? So, in effect, the scientific editor can use him as a referee. Sounds very clumsy. So it, it, it's, it's also true that Eric suggests statistical referees. That's true. Uh, what should we not talk about? It is a bit clumsy. I don't know a better way to do it. Um, we actually left out Jay and went to another another journal for that particular paper because we didn't know how to address this. There was no way to interact with no, the I, th I think the author gets the information that's needed. It's clumsy for the editor. Okay. The starting and after position is like a lot worse because there you have this whole series of different editors some of whom give contradictory requirements. Wow. <laughs> so I, I think this is certainly better and more straightforward. I don't know what to tell you. I mean, it's, I, I find it a bit clumsy as a process, but as far as I can tell, it looks clean to the author. Because to them, it just looks like another referee report. And they can reply to it. So I, I don't see that it's clumsy on that end. Yeah, it wasn't clear to us how to reply to it. It were just comments, and it's like, are we supposed to reply to these so the referee can see? Are we supposed to interact with the statistical editor? This is a detail, and I'm sure there are other questions you should be addressing. We, 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 have, not clear to us. we have always had the freedom to seek more than one referee for a given paper. Yeah, but there's usually only one you're interacting with at any one time. Right? At least in Usually. My Some journals you get three at the same yeah, time. submitted a, a great paper with a three-dimensional <coughs> static visualization of a 3D plot, okay? Right, and I of course, think, Right, I went for the simple, like, 
not interactive format because it, it made sense from my point of view, uh, time-wise, and like did not provide additional insight. Can I expect data editor no. to suggest that I actually create? No, because we don't have a. We don't have a. There is not a ridiculously clean workflow, and we haven't invested in creating one. So, you know. The, the, the way so many things work is that we're constantly looking for tools to then pass back to you. So if you did come, if you came to us and said, "I would like to do this," we would have answers, right? If you, if I have a radio data cube and I would like to create a, a visualization of that, um, we now have a tool that someone else wrote that should get credit for it um, that uh, we can pass back to you. But it, it is not the case that we're we would ever redirect you. Um, uh, we do have a project, which I can talk to you off, <laughs> not upstairs, and not, not like this, um, where we are thinking of investing in cases where you have a particular data set, and we want to provide you a wrapper that would enhance that. You shouldn't have to do any work in that case. So you're getting increasingly fancy displays of data. Uh, are you considering yet uh, virtual reality? Displays? Well, I, you know, funny enough, um, uh, no, we are not. But uh, by taking advantage, so this is a this is a question to um, can we make more progress with your article by uh, partnering with other companies or, or, or projects? Mm -hmm. So the Sketchfab examples that I gave, there are now three, um, will all connect to VR headsets, right? So in essence, without doing anything other than you know having those pixels push through our articles. Um, we're getting VR for free, right? You're getting, I'm not getting anything, the author is getting VR for free, right? Um, and I, and I, having gone through the process of trying to, you know, pick, take some open source tools and do what they can do, we couldn't get anywhere near the efficiency for the, you know, we're talking about two or three hundred megabyte, you know, rendered volume cubes, and they can stream it as if it's nothing. And we couldn't, we couldn't do it. Um, IRP tried, I tried, and so they have, um, you know, we're not in a contractual relationship with them. Um, uh, they have a model where you, as an author, can push your pixels through to any, any website. You can put this on anywhere. Um, but that, you, you mentioned VR, you get VR for free with, with that particular platform. So. Can, you, can you like reference a YouTube video? No, so, so we are not using YouTube as a streamer. I mean, you can reference it all that you, you wish. I mean, it, we won't, we're not pushing YouTube through um, we have our own um, platform. It's, if you need to know, it's, it's called Brightcove. Um, why we didn't use YouTube is a technical question that I'm not sure is interesting to this group. Um, why we don't then convert all your videos to YouTube videos is another interesting question that I, if, you, if people came to me and said, we want all of our animations on YouTube, that would be great because then I can go to IP and say, let's do this. Um, uh, but we have our own streamer instead of YouTube. Yeah. YouTube has one advantage that I want to bring up in this context, because I don't want to let go of the accessibility question, which is that if you if you saw my text for animations, the, the most accessible animation is one that is narrated, so that there is audio um, over the top of it, but as soon as you narrate it, you need to provide closed captioning for that. And YouTube has a very interesting workflow. If you narrate your art article, if you narrate your animation, they do closed captions. They don't do it right, but they get the timings right. So what that means is if you want a workflow, narrate your animation, dump it in, in YouTube, you get your timings right, edit the closed captioning, and then we can support all of that. And so you have a narrated closed caption video. I'm, I'm, you can see I'm trying to work on <laughs> author instructions to write on a piece of on, on, a, on a website to then distribute. But yeah. So, so how is this uh, related to publication cost? For example, uh, just adding a one video is more expensive than. So, figures, for example. so I, I don't want to go too far on this road. Um, the, the answer is that um, all digital, there's a digital quantity charge, right? So the way that the estimates is quantum. Yeah. And um, any float or any digital quantum is an additional, uh, element is an additional quantum, right? So a video instead of a static figure is one additional quantum, which is $26. Please don't make me go farther. <laughs> it's, it's a business thing I try to keep my head on. It's, yes, it does. It does have scale cost. Yes. But it's not twenty six dollars per frame of video. <laughs> no, no, no. no. <laughs> right, right, right. And nor is it twenty six dollars per online figure, right? So it's 
is twenty-six dollars per hundred L1 figures, right? For the figure set models. So, so it is a way of, in that case, it was a, it was a, it was done to reduce page charges because there's no reason to be charging that for just thousands of figures. Last question. Yes, up there. Yeah. So you're talking about narration. I don't even know why you're talking about having the creator narrate. If they've given you an adequate caption, right, you can have machine reading yeah. and generate it that way, and that might actually make things more robust and reliable from your right. point of view. That's right. And so from our from our perspective, the, the main goal is to ensure that the text is there and that it's readable by a screen reader technology. And caption so, can be generated the same way automatically, I'm imagining. I, I'm not entirely sure of that. I, I agree with you that it should be possible. I'm not entirely sure that it is possible. Like the, the, the magic of, of things like um, uh, text extraction, or, or not text extraction, but um, of, a, of um, a classification by Google, especially for video or images, I, I don't, you know, it's getting to the point where you can find cat pictures based on the fact that there's cats in the picture, not cats in the text. But um, uh, no, but I'm, I'm assuming that the yeah. creator, the author, has given you that block of text, just as written text, and then you can generate the yes. So the closed caption. You your point is, is if we can get them to write that block of text, yes. then we can. Yeah, yes. that's right. That's right. But that's far more work than they do now. Yeah. So yeah, it would require. Yes, there was the re-education. The re-education, absolutely. Yeah. Very last question. No, okay, let's thank our speaker.